Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio. Reporting from the basement of the Dairy Civic Center, this is C.M. Alexander with the news. Several women have been found bludgeoned to death with a hammer. There appears to be no link between the women or locations where this violence has taken place. However, Dairy Chief of Police released a statement saying, quote, We have promising leads and evidence to make sure we put this sicko away. You do the hammer crime, you do the hammer time. You're listening to Dairy Public Radio. This is Dairy Public Radio. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi-weekly Stephen King Book Club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Joshua Khan, alongside CM Alexander. Hello, everyone. And joining us via Zoom, the director who describes movies as his religion and watching them as his church, an avid consumer of behind-the-scenes documentaries, aspiring full-time filmmaker, and he is the director of The Dollar Baby, The Man Who Loved Flowers. Please welcome to the show, Jacob Ewing. Jacob, how are you? Hi, I'm doing well, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for taking the time out to, to join us. Oh, yeah, no problem at all. I, uh... You know, in the era of COVID, there's not a whole lot to do, so it, it makes <laughs> makes it even easier. <laughs> Free time abound for all of us. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, before we continue on with the interview, I'm going to turn things over to CM as she guards the rest of the interview. So, CM, take it away. Are you familiar with The Running Man? <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, ominous. That, yeah, I know. It's like... Uh, what's about to happen if I say no? I am vaguely familiar. I ha- I haven't read it, and I remember watching uh, it was Schwarzenegger movie, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, because I was a big Schwarzenegger fan as a kid. I remember seeing it as a kid, but I haven't revisited it since. Okay, and I only ask because that's how important these questions are. If you get them wrong, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then this interview is over. Yeah, the the, the, the yeah, hunter right. will unleash the hunters, and yeah, they will find yeah. you. I know. We just lost half the audience. (laughs) (laughs) All right. My first question. What was your introduction to Stephen King's work? I'm a 90s baby, born in 93. And so the first thing that I can remember in terms of Stephen King was the It miniseries. As a kid, I remember watching that. It wasn't live that I watched it, but it was on like a rerun. I remember watching it late at night. And it just scared the, can I, can I curse on this? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It scared the shit out of me. It was like, it was, it was absolutely terrifying. And I was one of those kids who was like easily scared by things, but I also was, I liked that scare. I liked that feeling. And so I became kind of obsessed with Pennywise and the losers club. And, you know, obviously uh, everything in that mini series was, quite the awakening. And so after that, it kind of led a lifelong love of all things King. What do you think about the newest movies? I thought they were, uh, I think the first one's great. Let me be yeah. clear. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think the first one's great. I think uh, Andy Muschietti, the director, he's clearly doing a, a solid adaptation, mm-hmm. but he's also doing it through the lens, in my opinion, of like A Nightmare on Elm Street. He's, he, you know, his version of Pennywise feels very Freddy Krueger to me. I really, as Freddy is one of my favorite, like, horror villains, I really appreciated that. And I think the first movie did a good job of balancing Mm -hmm. kind of like the, the, like, crazy carnival style horror with Stephen King's source material. And then I think the second movie got a little bit away and he started getting into like the later nightmare in Elm Street, <laughs> if that makes sense. That makes complete sense. Freddy is also my favorite of the slashers. And your answer is so perfect that even if you bomb this next one, like the hunter has been called <laughs> off. <laughs> perfect. Okay, good. I redeemed myself already. <laughs> but yeah, I thought they were really well cast, well shot, everything. And I think the first movie was a really solid blend of those two styles and the second one got a little off the rails Mm -hmm. but there's still good stuff yeah and it's nice to be able to say something like that about you know you liked the original one too so i i always feel bad when people are like oh i hated the remake because sometimes that kind of damages your memory of the original a little bit (laughs) so yeah i i'm definitely one of those guys who you know i can love an original thing that i saw you know back in the day but the remake is not going to hurt my my feelings of an old, <laughs> yeah. you know, an older property. The original's still there, right? So 
That's, that's always been kind of like my mindset. <laughs> we often talk about what we call Stephen King moment on our podcast, and that is something in his work that disturbs or delights us in a way that kind of sticks with you. Sometimes there's no reason that it should still be there, yet there it is. Do you have a Stephen King moment? There are a few. So like in terms of like a specific like line or anything like that, it's not really a specific line, but my favorite Stephen King book is Pet Cemetery. That book just completely riveted me and tore me apart and terrified me. It I went through every feeling. And not to get like super serious or deep or anything, like and be a bummer or anything, but I a few years back I lost a, a close family member who died too young in a tragic accident. And it was really a lot to to emotionally and mentally go through. We did get through it, but then it was maybe a year, maybe a year later, two years later, that I revisited Pet Cemetery, not even thinking about it. Mm. And it was just the way King describes Lewis Creed's unhinged reaction to losing Gage and just the way he describes Creed losing his mind from, from losing someone he loved, I could relate to having just gone through something, you know, a, tr- a tragic moment like that in my own life. Reading the way that King described just everything that he was willing to do and in his mind saying, you know what, I know this is probably going to end badly, but I am mourning the loss of my son so much that I don't even care. I'm just going to, you know, bury him. And there was just something about that writing that has haunted me to this day. It was something that, again, I, I related to because in, in the moment of losing someone you love, there is a part of you. It's like, I would do anything to bring them back. Mm-hmm. And this is the very dark side of that, right? What he would sacrifice, what a broken man is willing to do to bring back someone you love. And so that would be the, th- the moment that with Lewis Creed in the graveyard digging up Gage's body, I think is something that I think about at least every every couple of weeks, it just like floats around in my, mm-hmm. my mind rent free. So it's, <laughs> it's a lie. <laughs> it's hard not to. That whole sequence is so brutal. Like we mm-hmm. get, especially like people think that Stephen King stuff is all, you know, spooky monsters mm-hmm. and the equivalent of jump scares in movies. But mm-hmm. there is a, a romantic horror to doing something because your heart is broken mm-hmm. and you're trying to mend that and knowing that the consequences are going to be horrifying and you just have to anyway. Yeah, and it's that mystical horror mixed with the human element Mm -hmm. that I think transcends. I I think that's what King does so well at the end of the day. He can take the most fantastic properties and or fantastic story elements and he can make it really grounded and human. And so, yeah, I think think that in particular is just so scary because who wouldn't want to have the opportunity to bring someone back like that? Again, not to be a bummer, but... No, that's... <laughs> Would you consider that then your favorite adaptation? Or do you have one that tops that? So in terms of adaptation, I love the original Pet Cemetery movie. I did not necessarily care for the remake, but I think it has its own, it has its own moments. But in terms of like my favorite adaptation, I go back and forth because the the It miniseries was so influential to me mm-hmm. as just a, as a young person. That was a big one for me. Cujo was a big one for me. Mis- uh, Misery. Those were like some quintessential movies growing up for me. And I hesitate to say it because it is a recent release. And I usually like to like sit with a movie for a while to see how it like holds up over the years. But I was so impressed with Dr. Sleep. I adore that movie. Mm-hmm. Yes. I think it does such a remarkable job of blending King's source material with Kubrick's obviously very different adaptation. And it does it so well. I don't know how Mike Flanagan was able to do that (laughs) while also telling a horrific story of, you know, a group of like soul vampires (laughs) eating kids, but also being able to intertwine that with alcoholism and not becoming your father, you know, having those kind of deeper issues. And I think it's kind of all of the best of King's source material mixed with a lot of the, the best visuals and horror, which came from Kubrick's The Shining. So I think it's a really great combination of the book of the two. 
So I'd say for now, yes, I think that is my favorite is Dr. Sleep. But again, I know it's recent and I, I do want to kind of sit with it for a little mm-hmm. bit longer, but I'll, I'll say Dr. Sleep for now. Did you read Dr. Sleep right just before seeing the movie or after? Or not, be- was the- not before seeing the movie. I read, or not just before. I had read it when it came out, which was back in like, what was that, 2013-ish? But I remember reading that and I've been meaning to read it since watching it. But it was not something I watched. I, I watched The Shining right before going into the movie. I literally watched it. And then as soon as it was done, drove to the theater. <laughs> nice. So it was fresh in my mind. Uh, but no, I, I did not read Dr. Sleep right before. Yeah. I had, so I, my memory is a little foggy. I had read it. Uh, I read. I had not read The Shining either at the time. So when the Dr. Sleep was coming out, I burned through The Shining and Dr. Sleep in time to go <laughs> see the movie. And yeah, I 100% agree. It is baffling how well that movie marries all of the source material available into one cohesive story. The, the sacrifices that you lose from the novel in that exchange, 100% worth it, I think. I'd also say I don't know if there's a more horrific moment in a Stephen King... Well, there, there are a couple that are up there, but I'd say it's top five is the baseball boy scene. The baseball of like horrific boy scene moments. amazing! It's, it's yeah... Yeah, it's 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 so disturbing. And I remember listening to an interview before going to the movie and Flanagan's like, yeah, I, I did not enjoy shooting that. Mm-hmm. And like, just brace yourself. It's the most uncomfortable thing I've ever done. And I was like, oh boy. And sure enough, they delivered. That was incredibly <laughs> uncomfortable and horrific. And I still struggle to watch it. But it's, it is an excellent, excellent adaptation. I'd heard, had you heard the, uh, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but the behind the scenes story of the first take on that scene? No, I don't think so. Uh, I, I don't remember where I read this or saw this. The, you know, the, it, this kid is basically being tortured and it's brutal and it's horrifying and the kid is giving it everything he's got and they call cut and the kid just turns all smiles and he's like, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's amazing. I love that. <laughs> oh, yeah, it, that was... That scene yeah. has stuck with me since watching it. It's probably one of the yeah. most horrifying scenes I've seen in a recent horror cinema. Say, yeah, yeah. It's just that it it like I said, it mixes that that mysticism with that like realism that King does really well. So yeah, I really like that. What are what are your guys' favorite adaptations? I really love The Mist. I love yeah, the mist so say much. That. We, I rattled in my head. There's always the debate on the ending. Of course, the ending is so controversial. I love the ending. I'm all about Same. that ending. I do too. I understand why people don't, but I I would have been <laughs> fine with either ending. But I I remember seeing that for the first time. I'm like, wow, he outkinged King. That <laughs> ending. Right. I know, I, mine might be it's either Pet Cemetery or Misery. It's so. It's so hard. The adaptation of Misery oh. is so great. Yeah. Kathy Bates ma- makes Annie Wilkes so sympathetic and human in a way that yes. in my brain she already was. <laughs> she justifies what's wrong with me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. I think both are such excellent adaptations that you both brought up. And one thing, I, I think one of the brilliant things about Kathy Bates' performance as uh, Annie Wilkes in Misery I watched it recently and one of the things that I just was so unnerved by was how she doesn't like really swear Mm -hmm. or like when she gets mad, she like has like this kind of like Ned Flanders, like like, (laughs) stuff, which is very like, they set set that up throughout the movie. And then by the end, when she's like completely off the rail, she's like, you fucker, you, you know, cocksucker, you know, she's going like crazy and it's such an unsettling like change yeah that movie's brilliant and then the mist have you have you actually so as a screenwriter myself i like to read a bunch of screenplays have you read the mist screenplay no No. the ending of the mist screenplay for anyone listening wants to look it out it make it somehow manages to make that last the spoilers for the mist if you know 20 (laughs) years later you still haven't seen it but it somehow manages to make that last scene even more brutal and dark just by reading it because the way Darabont writes it the last sentence in the screenplay is obviously he's killed his friends and family and the the military has come to rescue him 
And the the last sentence in the screenplay, it just haunts me still. It's <laughs> whoever the character's name is screaming. He will never stop screaming. Fade oh, the black. Holy that is, shit! That is how it ends. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, that's insane. <laughs> And it like it just even now <laughs> I've seen that movie a million times, read that bit a million times, and it gives me chills still. Oh, oh it's so good! That's outstanding. <laughs> okay, now that we've talked about all of the amazing, <laughs> amazing movies we've gotten from Stephen King, what would you consider your least favorite? And least favorite doesn't even have to mean you don't like it. If you guys are like me, and I wouldn't dare say I don't like something, Stephen, <laughs> I can't be critical. <laughs> What, which yeah. movie do you think wasn't quite, missed the mark, I guess? I'm like you, where I don't really, even like the worst movies, I, <laughs> I try to find something like redeeming in them. Well, it's easy to um, do with horror because it's horror that yeah, it's exactly. so forgiving. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, it's like I, like we talked about earlier, I didn't really care for the It Chapter 2, but was there stuff that was great? Yes. Is there a scene where Jessica Chastain like swims through like a river of blood? <laughs> That's pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah, there's still stuff in there. My least favorite adaptation is probably the Pet Cemetery remake, the new one. Ooh, okay. uh, and that is less because it's a bad movie. I think on its own, as its own horror film, I think it's a pretty average to slightly above average mainstream horror film but as someone who is just so personally connected to the the original source material i can't say that i enjoyed my time watching it completely and i'm not even like a purist in terms of i'm all for messing with adaptations mm-hmm. like i like i mentioned earlier at the end of the day the original still there the original book's still there it's not going to like personally offend me if things are changed <laughs> it's just i don't think i think they made changes and didn't quite follow through on the promise of it or quite know exactly why they were changing things in the movie it's it's his daughter who dies instead of gage um the little kid and they the filmmakers did that because it would be easier to shoot with a you know 10 year old girl than a four-year-old boy there's something the whole point of pet cemetery the book well, not the whole point, but the large part of it is is his daughter's relationship with death and being a young person learning about death in the world. So by switching for ease of film production, which I understand, but by switching those characters out, it kind of robs the movie of its core thematic element of being someone learning and learning to accept death. And instead it ends up becoming just another creepy little girl who's stabbing, you know, people's ankles and, <laughs> and, and, and to, you know, that classic yeah. trope. Uh, but uh, yeah. And so, yeah, I, I was ultimately not thrilled with the, the pet cemetery. I mean, well, really. you, like you just gave me chills, <laughs> my hair standing up on my arms. Cause I, uh, it, I understand why people don't care for it. What I like about it is the more female centric, which we don't get enough of. So it's like, oh, thank yeah. you. But because it, of the reason it was done, like you said, they didn't think it through very well. So they didn't really have a good plan for it. It was a, a tool of convenience. And I really like the idea of it still being female centered because she has to grapple with that. So yeah. I, I yeah. would have really appreciated if they had either understood why they were doing that or just kept it but still focused on the the relationship between all the women because I, I was like yeah we have we have Ellie we have the mom we have Zelda like this is so cool and it just missed it yeah, yeah no I, I completely agree with you and you know in the book too the the mom has more to do she's when in the book and in the original story when it's running parallel to Lewis is going crazy and you know barren kids in the pet cemetery and whatnot. It's par- it's run parallel to the mom and Ellie mm-hmm. at her, her parents' house. And there's so much tension. And in the mo- in the new movie, it kind of like robs those female characters of their relevance, if you will. And it, it kind of, in my mind, it made them more generic than the book in the original story gave them. And so, so yeah, kind of just jumping off what you said. I, I, I agree. I think that's another reason that because uh, the mom and Zelda's like story is horrific and they kind of just use it as like a cheap kind of like monster jump scare thing when it's really it's it's horrific, but it's also tragic. And yeah. there's a lot of there's a really human element to that that 
I think could have been explored. Especially <laughs> because Zelda is so horrifying in the original. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, when So when this came out, we had a uh, Dairy Public Radio watch uh, premiere party at our local cinema. So we were all there watching it, and uh, Ben, our third co-host, when the when she fell down the dumbwaiter, we... It, it made us burst out laughing instead of being scared. Okay, I did not laugh. I jumped, <laughs> but I was ashamed. I was like, oh, they got me. Oh, it didn't earn that. They got me. <laughs> no, and we've, so we've talked to uh, several guests about the Pet Cemetery remake, and it's not until you brought up Ellie's struggle with learning about death that it really clicked that that was what was missing. I've always, yeah. like, I have always felt that. To me, one of the biggest misses is making the relationship between Ellie and Judd instead of Lewis and Judd. Right. Because in the book, that relationship is so good. It's like yeah. the you want to be a part of hanging out with these two guys. Because <laughs> it's just it's <laughs> yeah. it's that what is it's that surrogate father figure that oh, Lewis L- finds Lewis in it. Judd. Lewis and Judd, yeah. yeah. And uh and it missing that made the Judd's telling him about the pet cemetery feel a little more forced. Yeah, and there's that kind of, there is almost that like full core element to it. It's like two guys on a porch sharing a beer and like telling ghost stories. Yeah. That's essentially what they're doing. <laughs> and, you know, I love John Lithgow, one of the best actors out there. He was not right for Judd, I don't feel. And I don't like his, I know that the accent could be kind of like silly if done wrong. <laughs> Yeah. But I thought like, and like Fred Gwynn in the original is, does a really good job. It is kind of fun to like make fun of or like watch them, mm-hmm. but he does a really good job. And I think, I think having that kind of, again, they are at the end of the day it is it is a lot of like full core that they're missing out. And I think people miss the power of telling a scary story, right? You don't have to have those visuals necessarily. There's something we've been telling scary stories for as long as humanity's been around, right? And there's something sometimes more scary about the imagination than what we're seeing. And again, by having Lewis and Judd lose those moments where they can talk about the history, talk about you know their lives, you're one, losing a lot of dramatic weight and insight into where Lewis's mind is at later in the story. But you're also missing a, a really cool, unique way of, of scaring the audience. Like, do we need flashbacks to like the bull that guy like turns? <laughs> no, no. But if an actor like John Lithgow, if was given a moment to monologue mm-hmm. and just you focus the camera on him telling this really upsetting story and let the audience play with that, that's a really interesting scare that also adds that dramatic weight to what's going to happen in the rest of the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought about this a lot. <laughs> no, that's, I, I wish we could just, when we have filmmakers on, I just want to have a conversation about literally every Stephen King movie <laughs> because it's so much I fun. I, but I, I think <laughs> this would be a really good time to talk about why we have you on here because we've, we've kind of gone over what makes an adaptation good, bad, the risks that an audience will accept a filmmaker taking and, and kind of, I feel like you've alluded really eloquently the thought process that goes into that. We saw your adaptation of The Man Who Loved Flowers. Absolutely enjoyed it. For anybody who has not read the story, can you summarize the story? Yeah, and I'll I'll give away spoilers for anyone listening just because it's a four-page short story. And <laughs> yeah. It's kind of hard it's kind of hard to really discuss without it. So the basic gist is this man, he's like a really nice young man, clean cut. He's like a boyish young man. He's walking down the street and everyone he just has a smile on his face and this this air about him where everyone's commenting oh, that boy's in love, or like, oh, what a nice young man. You know, the, we kind of get that Stephen King-isms. He goes to a flower store. He buys some flowers for his girl, Norma. There's some really witty banter between him and the shopkeeper. He buys these flowers, and then he, he's going to go to his best gal, Norma, and give her these flowers. And that's kind of the setup of the story. He's walking back home. He goes down an alley. He sees Norma. He goes to give her the flowers. She, This woman turns around and goes, Hey, I'm not Norma. I don't know who you are. He goes, yeah, you are. And then pulls out a hammer and freaks out and 
bashes her head in for all intents and purposes. <laughs> and then he picks up the flowers and he goes about his day. And there's that chilling moment towards the end where as he's leaving, you know, there's an older couple who goes, that boy is sure in love. And then that's kind of how it ends. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a very twisty four pages. Yeah. <laughs> So of, of all of the films that were available to make a dollar baby, what made you choose The Man Who Loved Flowers? Yeah, so I chose it because I wanted to, I told myself if I'm going to adapt a Stephen King story, I wanted to do a Stephen King story that is scary. Because people forget Stephen King is an excellent dramatic writer as well. And a lot of the dollar baby options I felt like were either not classically scary or more dramatically leaning which is great. I think those stories are amazing, but I wanted to do something that could be kind of scary. I also wanted to do something that I could realistically film. You know, I had zero budget. I, you know, this is the middle of, well, this is like September of last year. So quarantine is in full effect. I knew it had to be a minimalist production. And so the, the fact that the story was so short and sweet really drew me to that. I really liked how King messed with audience expectations over the course of this very short story. It's, it feels kind of like a romantic, it, it's a period piece. It takes place around Vietnam War. Mm. The original story, the guy's listening to, he's listening to the radio and it's talking about the war and all these things that are weighing on his mind. But it feels ultimately just like a really upbeat, sunny, bright story that has a really dark twist at the end. And that was something I wanted to play with mm-hmm. visually. Yeah, and you for sure did. (laughs) (laughs) You focus this story uh, around our main character who is, for all intents and purposes, an an unreliable narrator because, as we talked about in the story, he's calling people Norma. How That has to be tough to convey. How did you decide to do that visually, and how long did it take you to come up with that style? Yeah, so one of the things is a lot of King's stories have those inner monologues, right? There's a lot of that... And so it can be kind of hard to adapt, and especially with that unreliable narrator. So I figured, well, look, I'm adapting it into a film, right? So so let's play with those audience expectations. So yes, the character himself is narrating, and there's that unreliable narrator moment to that. That's based off the story. But because we're in a visual medium, now I'm the unreliable narrator as the writer-director. I need to throw my audience off. And so I played with those... I wanted to make it feel that it was that romantic comedy, romantic drama, uh, visual storytelling, because that lulls the audience into a sense of security that I'm going to strip away from them in the end, but they don't know that it's using those conventions against the audience that we all know. And when we were, when we were filming, I told each and every cast member and crew member, I said, we are playing this straight. We are not, playing this as a creepy guy who's, you know, sharpening up his hammer or getting ready to go <laughs> kill, kill somebody. This is his world. I need this to feel like we're the, the people on the street going, oh, what a nice young man. This is so sweet. Uh, you know, that was the main direction was make it bright, make it cheery. Mm-hmm. Uh, cast a, the lead actor, Luke Heineman. He has like this boyish, handsome look to him. We We made sure he just looked clean shaven and nice and really just messing with the visual audience expectations in addition to what King had already wrote so that we could kind of blend the two. And that's why there's the narration in there too, uh, because it's kind of hard to otherwise uh, communicate that. Yeah. Having your, your lead actor, because you're right, playing it straight and having everybody fall around his world, he has to kind of fit that, that type. How hard was it to cast that role? It wasn't actually. Because, uh, <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Next question. No, um, <laughs> just kidding. So Luke is actually a good friend of mine, her younger brother. And about a year ago, maybe like a month or two before a pandemic really hit, he had decided he wanted to become an actor. And because he knew me through his sister, my good friend, he had reached out to me about just having a having lunch and just talking about like my advice for getting into acting and into the entertainment world. So I, about a year previous to us filming this, he had said, Hey, I want to be an actor. And we had had that conversation. And so when I was casting, I knew that, you know, this was going to be a quick production that it was going to be, like I said, no budget. This is all the, every single person was just 
hardworking professionals who had a passion for King and who had a passion for filmmaking that we, that I exploited. No, uh, <laughs> that, we, uh, that we all had that shared passion. So, we, you know, we were just going to make do with what we had. And Luke was in the back of my mind because, I, you know, I had already met with him and I knew this was something he was looking into. And while we did generally do some, uh, a few auditions, you know, ultimately when I saw that Luke was interested in being a part of it, it was a no brainer. He had, mm-hmm. he had the look, he had the chops, he, he had everything that I was looking for. And he was completely on board with the direction. He wasn't trying to make this a showy performance. He, I, I, I was very clear. I want it, I want it subtle and charming and playing with those expectations. I love that. Cause that's exactly how I would have described it. Yeah. His performance, <laughs> subtle and charming because we had there was another adaptation of this same Dollar Baby in the Stephen King Rules Dollar Baby Film Festival, so it was really cool to see two directors' visions of it. And that to me is what stood out about your version is that attitude from the lead actor. Yeah, he wasn't clearly suffering. Yeah. You weren't waiting for the other shoe to drop. Right, right. And like I said, that's not to say one way or the other is wrong. It's just that was my take on it. Was let's play with the, within this medium and you subvert those audience expectations. So at the end, when he does, his world crumbles around him and he starts, a, you know, murdering this, this, this innocent woman, it's even that more of a shock because if we had set it up previously that, you know, this is a grimy guy, this is a scary thing that that last moment doesn't quite hit as hard the way I think we set it up really Oh my gosh, you guys are going to hate me. Really hammers home the point <laughs> that we're trying to, <laughs> no, trying, we to trying to make here. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. Thank you for the kind yeah. of Now making an adaptation as we we've talked about with our favorite and least favorite adaptations, adaptations are hard to do. And in the process, you have to make some changes. What are some of the changes you made? Can you walk us through some of those? Yeah. So like I mentioned, we had no money. This is filmed like basically in quarantine. So rather than have it be a period piece, I said it in modern time, just so we didn't have to like come up with sets and background and all that. Mm -hmm. And then also, instead of having him go to a shopkeeper, I had him just talk about buying flowers with his roommate. Because to me, that was just, I wanted to have that like nice, like back and forth that King writes about in, in in the original story. But I just didn't have the time, budget, or honestly, safety measures for us to film at an actual store and have an, another actor portraying a shopkeeper. And it also kind of would have derailed the core story of like where we're heading. That's the main difference really is it's modern. And I, I substituted the shopkeeper that he talks with, with his, with his roommate getting advice because we all have friends that when we're making him or have had friends who, when we're making important life decisions, you know, we like to kind of have, like, hey, bro, what are you up to? Or like, hey, like, what do you think of this? You know, that back and forth. So it still felt, for me, it was, even though I was changing what King had wrote, it was important for me that the core reasoning for doing so still was the same. So in in King's version, he's talking with the shopkeeper. Even though I'm not doing that exactly, the main reason is to have that fun banter and like kind of lull the audience a little bit. So I wanted to make sure that I was maintaining that but adjusting accordingly. Mm-hmm. I did love um, the the roommate's line about uh, her moving in. The, yeah, the, yeah. Like, yeah, like nobody wants another finish, roommate. Yeah, yeah. Once, once you get <laughs> yeah. to the end and you see what is actually happening, <laughs> I thought it was very funny. Oh, did, you guys, you. <laughs> did you guys ever talk about, because, you know, the, the story doesn't really get into the the motivation for his, what's what's happening with him. Did you guys ever talk about what would be the backstory for this character and, and what how this all came to be? Not really. And that's interesting for me because I usually like to get into the, the Guillermo del Toro school of thought of like, you come up with a character Bible, right? You have that mm-hmm. backstory plan. But I also think that there's the risk that a lot of storytellers, myself included, have have had where... You, you risk telling too much and there is something that is scary about the unknown. And I think that's one of the more disturbing elements of this, of the King story is we don't know why he's like this, what he's doing, what kind of spurred this. The audience ultimately has those questions. 
we talked about it a little bit when I was talking with Luke and giving him directions, but really it was less about like where he came from and more of where his mindset is at any given moment. Now we talked about messing with the source material. The original draft of the script that I was writing was a completely different story. I was going to have it be from the woman's perspective and it was going to be a cyber stalker who would comment nice guy messages on her Instagram photos and always leave like a flower emoji on Mm. it. And it was going to be escalating that tension of that kind of like online harassment and kind of taking it from that view. And then ultimately, you know, we're at first it's like kind of, you know, it's like silly harmless. And then we escalate it to now he's outside her door and he's like breaking in and, I wanted to mess with that. And I, you know, a part of me thought about just going back and filming it that way too. I, you know, there was the idea that we would film it both ways so that we could almost, you could watch it in two different ways. One from his perspective, one from her perspective, what his reality was and what her reality was and really blend the two. So that was something we just ultimately didn't have the time or money or, you know, resources for, But that was the original idea was I was going to go a little bit more messing with expectations and and kind of maybe even try to do both. This is super easy for me to say, sitting here, not having to do anything, do it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that that sounds awesome. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, you're right. I mean, I technically could. (laughs) So (laughs) with with the license there, you know, it kind of, yeah, it stemmed from having friends and family who have gone through stuff like that. And there is something that to me was a little bit more overtly sinister Mm -hmm. and more traditionally scary that I think would have been interesting. I ultimately liked the idea of playing with those, those expectations of like the romantic uh, sunny, but yeah, no, I think, Mm -hmm. I think I appreciate those words. It is something I have considered going back. So who knows? What is it that you want the audience to take away from after they've seen your dollar baby? Uh, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I guess when I, when I, when an audience is done with the short film, I want them to kind of like find that they realize that they were not breathing, that they were on the edge of their seat and they didn't even know it. And then now they're kind of like recollecting themselves as the credits start to roll and the upbeat music starts to play because it, it is such a short story and it is such a, just a quick story you know it really is just about getting in and out and delivering that scare just hopefully they had a good time and read more king afterwards (laughs) yeah i at the end of the day i just hope that people enjoyed enjoyed what we did and can tell that we clearly had a passion even if we had limited resources we had the passion to tell the story I was thinking about that final scene and, uh, you know, loving horror movies, of course. I was super into the gore of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I hate to ask you this because you already told the story on the festival, but can you please talk about that yeah. again? <laughs> and yes. and any, other, any other stories you want to share? But I just loved that, that moment. I am happy to talk about that. I, it is one of my favorite parts of this whole thing. So really for me, when we were getting to the actual act of the, we, literally in the call sheet and everything, we refer to it as hammer time. <laughs> and that was, that was literally how we refer to it. And we kind of had that like joking nature on set because it is very dark material. And I also didn't want it to feel exploitative or mm-hmm. overly gory because at the end of the day, you know, yes, it is a shock and there is kind of like a, perverse entertainment value to watching that kind of gore. I didn't want to take away from the fact that at the end of the day, an innocent woman is getting her head bashed in. I didn't want to exploit that. And so to me, like I kind of mentioned earlier with the pet cemetery criticism, I do think there's something scarier about what is not seen sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is way better to see it too. Don't get me wrong. I (laughs) I love practical effects and gore. The next thing I'm doing is going to have a lot of that, but I wanted it to just have a still shot of Luke bringing the hammer down and have the blood spray on him. And you have, you have the spray of the blood and his face and the sound effects that we made are filling in the gaps Mm -hmm. for the audience so that one, we didn't have the resources to come up with like a fake head that we could cave in mm-hmm. and two it just it makes it a little bit more because you can't see it now the audience is filling in those gaps and it makes it a little bit more disturbing and scary 
But it's so funny because the way we shot it was so silly and fun. Basically what happened was Luke is, my actor is, he's got his hammer and every time he brings it down, I'm just off screen with a little plastic container of spirit Halloween blood that I have (laughs) because I just have blood in my house at all times. (laughs) And I had a paintbrush. My wife suggested I use a paintbrush and I would dip it in blood. And then every time he brought the hammer down, I'd flick it with my, (laughs) I just flicked the the paintbrush (laughs) on him and it would spray onto him. And, and then I, if you listen to just the raw footage, you can just hear my nasally voice off screen going, Go. Go. Okay. Okay. All right. Hammer now. Go. Go. And so every time he did it, and then, you know, I, the camera guy, I told him, do not stop until I tell you to stop. And so we kept going. I'm like, I'd rather have more than less. And then finally, I don't, it wasn't in the script, but I, I told Luke, I was like, hey, Luke, look directly into the camera and smile. That's going to be really scary. And he, he did it. Like some actors might be like, what? Huh? He was so professional. He just like took the direction without even like adjusting. And he just looked straight into the camera and he gave us that smile. And that gave us the, the very unsettling final shot that I needed here. He's this very nice, well-cut, handsome man covered in blood, smiling because he's in love. And then we cut <laughs> the black and music. You just painted our listeners a very lovely word picture yes absolutely <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to know the the sound effects too the because we needed the crunch of and squish of brain and <laughs> so all that was was my uh my sound guy who was incredible he went to a, a deli or a butcher shop and he found he he bought like a a, a chicken carcass that they had and he took that chicken carcass and he actually recorded himself slapping it, hitting it with a hammer, getting that squish, Mm. (laughs) as well as crunching uh, bell peppers so that we could get the crack. So we just layered it. So there's the crack for the first like hit or two. Mm -hmm. And then after, if you really listen closely, after a uh, a crack or two, then you start getting the chicken squish and like the slap. That's amazing. (laughs) I I really do like that because you mentioned you love practical effects and and I do too, but there's, it's such a fine line showing Mm -hmm. the monster essentially. And in this case, of course, the monster, we're looking at him, but showing showing her head and, and what he's done to her. I like that we're with him this whole time and you know to us he's just a guy in love and even at the end when there's this evidence that maybe things aren't on the outside what they seem to him we're still with him we don't see the mm-hmm. aftermath of what he's done so I, I think that's a really cool choice i'm really glad you picked up on that and mm-hmm. thank you very much because the the first line of the story in his narration is love is a terrifying thing and that that whole monologue that he's writing I knew I had to write it from an honest place. So this is going to sound so fucked up, but (laughs) I wrote the monologue of him like being in love based off my feelings for my wife when I was proposing (laughs) to her. And so, so that, and that's insane, right? That's amazing. Yeah. So so there is that, there is that level of honesty to it that I thought needed to be, it can't just be sentimental, you know, Hallmark love card. It had to be honest, Mm -hmm. but we start with love is a terrifying thing because he's proposing and that makes sense within the story. But then at the end, you know, it's a little on the nose, I'll admit, but at the end when he's covered in blood and he's staring at the camera smiling and we repeat the line, love is a terrifying thing. And now it has a whole new meaning to it, Mm -hmm. but you're right. We've stayed with him this entire time and hopefully it's been honest to his journey through the whole thing. It, it, like you said, we don't ever cut out of his world. Yeah. We're just in it. No, that is the terrifying thing. It is totally honest to his journey and to to make your audience stay with that person and, and experience that honesty, quote unquote. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, yeah. I yeah. feel kind of sick and rad. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, feel, I feel disturbed for enjoying this yes. journey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, that, that's, honestly, that tells me mission accomplished. Yes. That's, like, yeah. that's what we were looking for, so Although thank you. Although I would absolutely be delighted to see, like, if, when you decide to show the monster, because I've had that happen to me. I'm like, oh, don't show it, don't show it. And then somebody did, and the director just had the skill to pull it off to make what I saw crazier and more fantastic than what I could imagine. And those Mm -hmm. moments too have their own different kind of payoff. 
yeah, it's a fine line. And yeah. I, I'm actually like, I'm very excited to start messing with that mm-hmm. myself. No, so what has the response been from uh, audiences that have seen it or your cast and crew when they si- finally saw the final product? So the cast and crew really loved it. We're here in Tucson, Arizona. So the filmmaking community is, is small, but it's very tight and everyone knows each other. And they, they, so the reaction has been really overwhelmingly positive from, from the people here in town, right? Very happy with what we, what we managed to achieve completely based off our passion for horror, for King, and for filmmaking. And then honestly, too, with thanks to Stephen King's uh, Rules Dollar Baby Festival, the audience that got to see it has been so incredible. I, I, you know, I said it in my interview with them, too, and I'll say it again. The horror community is the best community. I love it so Amen. much. It, it is such a just beautiful wonderful insane empathetic mm-hmm. cra- just everything you could you could think community and they've been so welcoming to me and our cast and crew in this film i filled it to the brim with stephen king references and so i was so happy when people were picking up on that in particular when he's driving there's a bumper sticker, <laughs> bumper sticker. That, says, yes. that says flag 2024 <laughs> on it and i i thought it was a fun little like gag but People went nuts for it online. I got so many people <laughs> tweeting at me about the 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 freaking bumper sticker. So finally, I just I I literally because I just made it the day of. I thought, oh, that would be a fun little Easter egg. And so I I if anyone wants it, it's on my. I posted it on Twitter and on Facebook, so you can find it. You can print it. You can do whatever you want with it. It, it exists out there. But yeah, the, the community has been so kind and so welcoming. It's honestly, for me as a young, aspiring filmmaker who's really still learning, it, it, it's been the best experience of my life. And I, you know, I, I, I can't thank everyone who's been a part of it enough. It truly has been something special that I'll never forget. Looking back on everything, especially God, filming during COVID, what a headache. <laughs> but if yes. you looking back on this experience, if you could give a piece of advice to anybody listening to this interview, who's thinking about doing a dollar baby or has a dollar baby, what piece of advice would you give them? It, it's, it's tricky. Cause there's like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that can kind of go into it. The number one thing I tell aspiring filmmakers like myself, and again, this is not me saying, Oh, I'm so much better than everyone. <laughs> this is me. This is me having learned from experience and wanting to share the wisdom is I think a lot of young filmmakers look at other things that have been done well, and then they copy them without understanding why those were done well in the first place. And so what ends up being presented is a cheap imitation that feels hollow and doesn't have that understanding or that passion behind it. So I always tell people to be aware of that. And when you're adapting a Stephen King story or you're making anything, Tell it from your perspective. That doesn't mean you're not taking elements of things that you love, but understand why you're taking those elements, why you're doing things the way you're, you're doing. Because there's only one you at the end of the day. We, obviously, with The Man Who Loved Flowers, we saw there were two adaptations, very different adaptations. Mm-hmm. With this story, 100 people could adapt it, and every single person was going to do it differently. So really lean into the you of it all and understand why you're doing it. And even if it doesn't come out exactly how you want it, that passion, that, that understanding, those fundamentals will reflect on screen, whether you know it or not. And the audience will pick up on that. And I think that's what sets apart good technical filmmaking from overall great filmmaking. And that's something that I strive to do with everything I do is really lean into what is Jacob Ewing's take on that. And that's, that's filtering it through, references and love and passion of everything Mm -hmm. you know i love so many things and i do crib from a lot of stuff but i I try to filter it through my lens so to to kind of like sum it up just filter everything storytelling and filmmaking wise through the you of it all and people will people will appreciate that yeah i think that that's a really fantastic point to make you know honoring your own personal part of it that you bring into a project because people inevitably are going to connect with some piece of that no matter what based on their own experiences too. So not discounting what you bring to something I think is really important for people. Yeah, yeah, I I completely agree with that. 
you you've had this film you I, I presume you're working on some more things now so tell us what interests you right now what's what's next for Jacob Ewing so I still you know uh, since I was a kid I've been very set on becoming a filmmaker I always say that uh, Steven Spielberg made me fall in love with movies but it was Sam Raimi that made me believe that I could make movies <laughs> and nice. so that's been this like headstrong passion, uh, whether it's smart or not, it's always been make movies, make movies, make movies, and you will find film film in that. So I am continuing to make movies and I, I've only done shorts in the past and I am doing another short as my next project because in my mind, because the horror community has been so receptive and awesome and open, it has, there is a little bit of feeling like, I, I love this genre so much. I want to stay in it. I want to mess with certain things. I want to continue to better myself as a filmmaker. And also not saying that I'm not interested in other genres, but I found my people who like what I'm doing mm -hmm. now. So it's like, to me, it's important to not betray that by saying, I think some filmmakers are like, oh, I like horror, but it's not drama or I like <laughs> horror and it's not, yeah. it's, it's not comedy, you know? And so I, I, I feel like, at this point in my life, doing anything else would almost be a betrayal of myself and the this community that's been so good to me. So the next thing I am doing is a short horror film. Very excited for that. It's an original. It's not an adaptation. And kind of getting into the practical practical effects side, I am so excited for this. This is the biggest thing that I've done in terms of scale and ambition. And it's really a contained haunted house movie with a big practical effects monster at the center of it mm -hmm. and kind of getting into what we talked about. It is, it is that balance of when to show it, when mm -hmm. not to show it because there's the jaws approach where you don't really see it to the end. But I think that worked for jaws. Sometimes you don't want to wait that long because if you let the audience wait too long, they're going to lose interest. And if you don't show enough of it, why even have the monster kind of thing? But also, <laughs> if you show too much of it, then it's too scary. So it has been so exciting to find that balance of the horror and the humanity and the thematic elements that we're tackling uh, within this big, you know, I've done ghost stuff. I just did a serial killer thing with this adaptation. So in my mind, it was the next step was monster. So I'm really leaning into, as a, as a lover of that genre and just of monster movies, I really wanted to do something that will hopefully take a lot of what I learned with this short in terms of twisting audience expectations and really messing with those conventions and make something that will have audiences gripping their seats in terror and white knuckling through it. You know, I've had people who read the script who wouldn't finish it because it was too much for them, <laughs> awesome. and, which is the best kind of, you know, thrill for me as a, as a film a creative but I want people to have those scares. And by the end of it, I want people to feel like they just got off of a roller coaster. Like mm -hmm. there's the excitement and that like thrill of like, we just survived, you know, Sam Raimi talks about carnival style horror. That's his evil dad. That's the most influential mm -hmm. series in my life. And that very much like scare the audience. But by the time they're done, they want to go again because it was yeah. so much fun. So. <laughs> Well, if in in that film, you know, there's a voice on the radio or over a PA system. You yeah. have you have our email. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I legitimately, I I am. There is a no spoilers really, but there is I there is like a bit of an homage to the thing in it, uh, in terms of like the the noise being made with a mm -hmm. lot of a lot of stuff being in it. So who knows? I, I am going to need a bunch of people just making freaky noise. Awesome. Yeah. 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 <laughs> just send us an email. We're in. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Where can our listeners keep up to date with what you're doing? Where can they find you and follow you? Yeah. So I'm on, uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, Jingleheimer, <laughs> J-I-N-G-L-E-H-E-I-M-M-E-R. Jingleheimer. And then I am on YouTube and uh, Instagram at Jacob Ewing presents. And yeah, that's, pr if you want to see a bunch of like cringy old stuff that I've done, <laughs> go on my YouTube and you can see that I, I leave it up. I leave it up because it is cringy, but I think it's important to show the growth yeah. and let people know that like, yes, you can, you know, I taught, I, this is so embarrassing, but I taught myself editing and like pacing and working with structure through making like like fake trailers and music videos 
like just using movie mm-hmm. clips, you know, and they're, they're very, you know, it's a little embarrassing now, but it taught me a lot about pacing and, and, and editing that is invaluable. So there's a lot of that on my YouTube, <laughs> but you can, you can kind of see the evolution. So check me out there or on Instagram. I'm always posting weird, silly stuff and Twitter, Twitter. I love that's, that's the hellscape that I can't resist. <laughs> so. Well, Jacob, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk with us. It was such a pleasure getting to interview you. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Like, this is a blast. I, I, as I warned the uh, audience beforehand, I know I get to, I chat a lot. So hopefully I wasn't overwhelming or anything <laughs> like that. But I, I, I'm just so passionate about this film, about King, about horror, that getting the opportunity to speak with like-minded individuals is just the biggest thrill. So I can't thank you enough for letting me be a part of this. That's it for this episode of Dairy Public Radio. As always, thank you for listening. Join us for our next episode. For CM Alexander and Jacob Ewing, this is Joshua Khan reminding you, the unknown is scary. Don't risk sharing too much. Hey everyone, CM Alexander here. Thank you for listening to our interview with Jacob Ewing, director of The Man Who Loved Flowers, Dollar Baby. You can follow Jacob at Jingleheimer on Twitter and on YouTube and Instagram at Jacob Ewing Presents. We'll include those links in the show notes as well. And you should follow Jacob because he was so very, very kind and gave us a preview of the monster in his upcoming horror film. Obviously, we can't show you and we wouldn't ruin the surprise in any case. But here's our reaction to Jacob's vision. Before I go, do you guys want to see something really cool? Yeah. yeah. Like, we talked about practical effects, and that's something I'm just so in love with. And we designed this like big, scary monster. I'm starting to get the first bits of. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Holy shit! <laughs> oh, <what? laughs> yeah, that looks so isn't cool. this amazing? I was telling my wife, I I like have these photos on my phone now, and I look at <laughs> I look at I look at him like it's like my fucked up little son. <laughs> like this is like this is my child that like I'm just so proud of, and I'll show you her wearing it too. This is uh, oh. my amazing FX artist. This is a work in progress, but. It's just like seeing it. It's worse on a human body. Yeah, oh, oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> the moving, the and, jaw. Yeah, oh. and the, and the oh, ball. So, so gross. So. <laughs> That's all for now, listeners. Goodbye.